Hi, my name is Heath Jones, and if you're watching this, you probably already know that I'm the pastor at Northwood Christian Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. But just in case you don't know or you don't know about Northwood, you ought to check out our website for more information about our ministries and our worship times and the different things going on here at our church. Our website is www indyncc.org that's www.indyncc.org but for today we're going to consider a passage that's found in the book of acts chapter 1 verses 1 through 11 and it goes as follows in the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward the heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. I should say up front that I love this passage. Emphasis on love this passage, this story from the Bible. In fact, I've preached on it several times. I went back through some of my older sermons, and I've discovered that I usually have very little trouble engaging this story. And this year seems to be no exception. And I think that the reason it resonates with me so well is that it encapsulates in one short story what all of my life sometimes feels like. What I mean is this story encapsulates the feeling I get when I am caught between great events and important moments in my life. The moment comes, it is great, I have an adrenaline rush, excitement, dopamine, it leaves me, the moment's over, clean up the wrapping paper, put away the chairs, now what? And the disciples in today's story have been living at a rapid clip. They had been following Jesus all over the wilderness from town to town, learning from him and bearing witness to the wondrous signs and the miracles that were worked by him. And they were participants in Jesus' life-giving work themselves. Jesus cut them in on it and they, they worked along with Jesus. But then Jesus, he died. And then he arose. So we have a, an emotional and physical roller coaster that the disciples have been subjected to. But then, in today's story, Jesus up and leaves again. And now the scene shifts back to everyday, mundane living, just like things were before Jesus came into their lives. It's as though they've endured an in-person, immersive, in-depth seminar on the gospel, a crash course on God's power and priorities. But now they've graduated their instructor and role model has left, and so they're left thinking, now what? And I remember similar feelings after, say, graduations, whether it's high school, college, seminary. You know, you fly through life learning. You have all of these objectives and goals just on the horizon, papers due, tests to take. 
and it's a whirlwind of activity. But then you graduate and you're left with a certificate and the assurance from your teachers that you can do this, that you can do what you hope to accomplish by way of your education after the fact because they've prepared you. They've set you up well to accomplish the tasks at hand. But some of us sitting in our seats waiting to walk up and receive our diplomas aren't so convinced that we are ready to take on whatever comes next. And some of us can't believe that it's really over. And the disciples seemed to feel this way in today's story. They asked Jesus about the coming of God's realm and when it will come in full. And they can look around them and see that there is still a lot of work to be done. And so they ask him, when will the kingdom restore Israel? And Jesus replies, it's not for you to know the times or periods that my father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to all the ends of the earth. I think that's a frustrating answer to the question. When will the world be fixed? And Jesus answers, can't tell you. But one thing is certain. You are going to be a part of it. You are going to be a part of what brings God's realm down to earth. And then after saying this, Jesus it leaves. In the past, I've used the example of coaxing my kids to clean their rooms to help describe this dynamic that we're seeing here in this story today. And it still works, I think. And let me explain it again. I started asking my oldest child to clean her room when she was very young, say two or three even. And, you know, asking a three-year-old to clean her room is a kind of joke. And then asking a two-year-old, I mean, really, what do I think I'm going to accomplish by that? What is, what's the point? But whatever the case, I found myself in that absurd, absurd position time and again. Legos scattered across the floor, stuffed animals in every corner of the room, books pulled down off their shelves, pages torn, the floorscape smacking of post-apocalyptic nightmare. Stressful for a parent, but nevertheless, I turn to thems that made the mess and say, Okay, kids, it's time to clean the room. And you already know what happens next, if you've been in that position before. And, and to her credit, my five-year-old today may pick up a few Legos and put them in the bag that holds them. And my four-year-old, getting the idea, may even manage to toss a few toys in the bag. But 30 seconds in, you'd better believe that they're playing with their toys again and they're even undoing some of their preliminary work, dumping the bag of Legos back onto the floor moments after they've been cleaned up. As with Jesus and his disciples in the wilderness, I strive alongside my children to usher in a new age, if you will, the age of the clean bedroom, if only it could stay. And in that moment, I do most of the work. But the whole while, I'm empowering them with the gifts and the abilities to do something about their dirty rooms for themselves. And as my eldest child has grown, I've begun to leave her in her room to clean it on her own. Sometimes I don't even go up there. I, I say something like, I'm going downstairs now. I'll come back soon to check on how things are going. In a similar way, Jesus turns to the disciples and in so many words says, I'm leaving. Keep up the good work while I'm gone and, you know, I'll be back to, to check in. I find the scene described here somewhat amusing. Just picture it, if you will. The, the disciples are left staring into the clouds. And you can imagine the sound coming back around them. Maybe the birds that were chirping the whole time have been drowned out in the noise and now the, their sound rises again and they notice it again. The wind blowing in the leaves that they had not heard moments before. You can almost hear the questions in the back of their minds as the sounds of normality arise around them. Well, now what? And you can imagine the disciples jumping, startled by the voices of the two men we read about in the story that they hadn't noticed, those two men dressed in white, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward the heavens? 
I'm reminded of my nine year old when she was younger. I I'd basically do this, the work for her, all the work, in fact, and I'd take triple the time to do it because I would insist on doing it alongside her. Because it's this father's desire that as she grows, she can be about her father's work, or at least as it pertains to cleaning her room. And over time, I have engaged less and less, and she's gotten better and better at cleaning her room. So when she tells me that her siblings have made a mess of her room, or have pulled down all the books, I say in so many words, why do you stand looking toward, well, not the heavens in this case, but maybe at the floor? Go clean it up. Now it's your turn. You can do it. You have everything you need to start. I'll be back to see how you're doing later. This is exactly what we find in the book of Acts. Jesus leaves, but his friends discover the same spirit of God that enlivened Jesus is alive and active in them. And so they took on the work themselves, and the rest is history. They loved their neighbors. They healed. They restored lives. They restored outcasts to their communities. They found that they could do the work. And it made a difference. And so I say to you, my church, Northwood Christian Church, we can do this too. In fact, we're here because we've been called to this purpose. And, and just as it is my hope that my children will one day assume all the responsibilities that they should, and that they will come to know their strength and capabilities and then put their life's energies towards life restorative work. God hopes that we will do the same. God hopes that we will begin to clean our rooms, clean house, restore communities, aid in the restoration of lives. And of course, the work is hard, but God has given us the Holy Spirit to inspire us, empower us, and to help us discern the way. And what the church most needs to do is to get moving. Why do we stand looking towards the heavens for an answer for this broken planet and its faithless and corrupt human race? When the Spirit of God lives in us and has already given us all that we need, we can do this. We can do all that we've been called here to do. And I don't need to tell you there is a lot to be done. Humanity is just as violent towards one another as it ever was, but it's on a global scale now unprecedented. Inequities still abound in our country and across the globe. Unnecessary poverty, poverty that we could address and change. And millions without access to what they need to live well, water, food, health care, children held in detention centers, ensuring that trauma will roll forward and ensuring a probably bleak future. Mass incarceration and for-profit prisons, greed and rampant consumerism. I could go on and on. You no doubt know all about the problems. The room's a mess. But when I come back to check on my daughter to see how things are going, I'm often proud to discover that not only has she put her room back in order, or mostly at least, but she has taken the initiative to reorganize it, creating an even better space for her to dwell. And when God checks in, as if God ever really leaves us, will we be found to be cleaning our rooms or have having cleaned our rooms or having changed what we could possibly change in our world to make it better? Will we be found to be about our Father's work? Or will we be found to be staring at the sky, waiting for what? Waiting for who? Because the Spirit of God dwells in us. It turns out we don't need to wait. To which God's people may reply, okay, fine, we'll get to work, but by doing what? And perhaps it's time for me to be overly simplistic. Here it is. We must get to work keeping the most basic commands, which Jesus said were, one, love God, and then the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Do you know anyone in your life who is hurting? Invite them to, 
to church, to your church, into the life and into the life that you found in God. That's loving them. Invite them into the fold of a time-tested, travel-worn, loving community who has been drawn together in the name of God's love and because of our love for one another. In short, when we invite someone to church, we are inviting them into our communion, our life together, our story, and into the network of mutual support that has held us. This is one way we can love our neighbor, inviting them in, inviting them in to love them as they need to love as we have been loved. So do you know of anyone in your life who might benefit from a place like that, a place like our church at Northwood? And of course, I'm sure you do. So let's not stand around waiting for Jesus to do sin yet again. He's right here. Let's share this good news with those who need to hear it. So to answer the question, what now? What work is there for us to do? Very simple. This week, think hard about who needs some hope and support. And then invite them into our community, your community, your network of support. And we who have been witnesses to the works of God, who have been empowered to share what we have found with the world and invite them into the Christian communion that has nurtured and supported us, it's time for us, you and me, to connect the love that exists in our community with those who need it. So to the question, what now? There is not a better time than now to share the gospel. And I trust you'll each do so in your own unique God-given way. And in our day, same as in Jesus' day, there are no end to the numbers of people who must find a path to love. And when we invite them along that path, we are inviting them to church in the truest sense, not to a spectacle or a worship time at, on a Sunday morning, but into the love of a nurturing community that surrounds them in every season. So again, the question, now what? Well, there's no more standing around looking for something to fall from the sky. That's for sure. Jesus may have ascended into the heavens, but we are not left alone. We are chocked full of God's Spirit and are capable of doing amazing things in the world. And it's time to invite others in, inviting them to church in the deepest sense, into a community of love. And the good news is, as it would turn out, Jesus' body seemed to have left us. But the body of Christ is still here. We are it. So let's not stand around. Let's get going. You, me, we can do this. So let's clean our rooms. Let's change the world. Let's resolve together to not get caught standing around. Let's get going. We can do this.